It's good to be back with all of you again this week. And joining us today to share his insights is Dr. Matthew Beal, Chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and Georgetown University School of Medicine. October 10th marks Mental Health Awareness Day around the world. And for this week's conversation, we continue our focus on the pandemic's impact on our families and children and reflect on the importance of activities to support mental health and well being. Over these past 20 months, we have worked to implement a comprehensive, layered public health program. We've also expanded our efforts to support the mental health and well being of our community. With the onset of the pandemic in the United States in spring 2020, our existing resources, CAPS, our Center for Counseling and Psychiatric Services for our students, and our faculty and staff assistance program moved to telehealth models. Now in this new semester, we have returned to in-person operations for these services. In recent months, we've also launched a number of additional resources for our students, faculty, and staff to help our community navigate the mental health challenges associated with the pandemic. Last December, with One Medical, one of our healthcare partners, we began providing an additional free virtual service for faculty and staff, Mindset, a 24-7 therapy and coaching program. And since mid-January, with another partner, Timely MD, we have offered a new telemental health service, Hoya Well, to our students. We continue to provide these two virtual services, Mindset to faculty and staff, Hoya Well to our students, for free, recognizing the challenging circumstances created by the pandemic. Over this past year, we saw a 10% increase in the number of student visits supported by our mental health services. We are working to encourage greater awareness of our resources through a comprehensive web portal. This is a place where members of our community can find mental well being resources, counseling information, information on nutrition and exercise, meditation, connections to campus ministry, and to other resources on our campuses. We share these resources on social media and through a series of videos. Let me share with you one of our most recent projects. As we come together this year, we approach a time of transition. At points, this year may not seem like it was before. Every Hoya everywhere has their own experiences. We all carry our own set of challenges and feelings. At points, you may be experiencing a sense of imbalance, stress, or even new emotions. So remember, it's okay not to be okay, but that doesn't mean you have to face these challenges alone. There are many ways for you to take care of yourself and your fellow Hoya's well-being. Simple acts of kindness can go a long way. Taking care of yourself is a start. Taking care of others makes a difference. And remember, we are here to help, and we want to help. Every Hoya cares. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Matthew Beal to join me in conversation. Dr. Beal is Chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and Georgetown University School of Medicine. Dr. Beal has deep experience and expertise working with families on mental health and well-being. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Let's, let's jump right in. One aspect of the pandemic has been that we have seen greater attention to the mental health and well-being of children. Prior to the pandemic, our children and young adults have increasingly faced mental health challenges, particularly in their early teenage years. We know one in five adolescents will experience a mental illness that persists into adulthood. You've been working with children and families throughout the pandemic. Are you seeing shifts in how parents and families are engaging the question of mental health for children and adolescents? 
Yes, yeah, Jack. Thanks for the question. I, and and um, I, I think you you you're right on about that. That there's a there's an an openness to addressing some of these questions, some of these issues that we're seeing for from kids themselves, from their parents, from their teachers and schools, um, from the communities about about mental health. That is. Um, Amidst all of the the really tough news that's gone on in the last year and a half plus, I, it it is a, a glimmer of good news because what it what it means to me is that there's there's a degree to which stigma around these issues is weakening fast, and that creates an opportunity for us to to be more helpful, um, to provide more support to kids who for a long time um, have been struggling silently. Um, or struggling without really knowing how to how how to get help, or struggling without necessarily support or understanding from their families that they really are getting now, and I think that's hugely hugely helpful. And it also opens up the opportunity for us to not just intervene around mental health concerns when there when there's a crisis, but actually to think about intervening upstream and to be investing time and effort and resources and expertise in a continuum of mental health care that starts with prevention. And promotion, and then goes on to include intervention and treatment as well. So I think all of that is happening just as you just as you laid out. Now, when we talk about mental health for our students here at Georgetown, we often talk about flourishing. We think about their development as young people, identifying those blocks, internal or external, that may be preventing them from feeling a sense of flourishing in their lives. How do we think about mental health? during childhood and adolescence? And how does it differ from the experiences of adults? How can parents and caregivers know when it might be important for them to seek some guidance from someone like you? And what are the kinds of resources out there for families? I, I, th I think flourishing is, is, a, is, a, is a beautiful concept for across the lifespan. And what it means to flourish means, means something a bit different for, for a toddler or a preschooler, for a, an elementary school age kid, for a teenager, for a Georgetown or other college student, for a young adult. For, and and as, as we know, as you move into adulthood um, and different stages of adulthood, flourishing means different things as well. And so I think what parents can be asking themselves, parents of, of kids of all ages, of, of, of young kids and parents of college age students, is what, what does it mean for, for my child to be flourishing? And it's, there are, I think there are some core components. Um, when we think about it, it, sometimes we talk about with, with families and with other stakeholders, we talk about, think about sort of a, a, a wheel of your life. And it's got these different components. There's, there's the component of, of how are you doing socially? Are you building and forming and building and strengthening relationships in your life? How are you doing intellectually? Or is, is your mind growing? Are you being challenged? Are you taking on intellectual challenges and stimulation? Um, how are you doing in terms of your emotional balance? Are you experiencing a range of emotions, but not being dominated or ruled by any one emotional state? Um, how are you doing in, in terms of your vocational development and, and your ability to connect with, with, with meaning and purpose? And what are you giving back? Um, how are you doing spiritually and, and soulfully? Are you, are you feeling connected to something bigger than yourself? Um, each of the one of those aspects has a, a, an example for, for a five year old um, and for a 12, 10, 10 or 12 year old and for a 15 year old. Um, those change, of course, over time. But as a parent, if you see your child really struggling in one of those areas where, for example, they, they're clearly excited by school, but they're feeling but they're really stymied in relationships or they're doing great socially. But at home, their emotions are just a roller coaster. Um, and it, parents know when something is out of balance and there can be a tendency as a parent to say, well, I just, I hope it's nothing. So I'm going to assume it's nothing. Um, and I think the best thing that parents can do when they, when their radar gets turned on is like, is, is my child's, are my child's emotions too out of control? Or is the fact that my child still doesn't have, is nine years old and still doesn't have a close friend? Um, or the fact that my child is 12 or 13 years old and continues to really struggle to engage with school at all. Um, that, when that starts to stand out, I think the first thing parents can do is talk to other people in your community. Talk to trusted uncles and aunts and folks at church or folks on, uh, who are other parents on the soccer team or folks on the block and say, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing this thing about my kid. 
well, tell me about your kid. And what that does a few things. One is it provides some developmental context. Maybe other kids are struggling in the same way at the same, same age. Two, it's a very generous act because it destigmatizes that kind of questioning for all the people around you. It makes them more likely to honestly wonder, are, are they doing okay? Are their kids doing okay? Um, and so it, it opens up a degree of, of fluency of conversation among community members that we can all be talking about this and at times reassuring one another and times saying, gee, that sounds really tricky. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to get some help. And then ways to get help are to go to the institutions in our kids' lives. So to talk to your pediatrician, to talk to your internist if you're a young adult or an adult, to talk to a teacher or a guidance counselor at the school, talk to a pastor or a minister or a rabbi or a mom, someone who has, I guarantee you, heard this question before, has heard it two or three times this week, and won't be floored by it, won't be overwhelmed by it, and will be eager to help and be able to sort of steer you towards resources in your community that might be a mental health professional, like someone on, on my team, um, or might be an intermediate step. Here's something to read, or here's some things to try at home, or here's some things that I found to be helpful. Um, and just opening up that conversation creates an opportunity to start to intervene in a way that I think is really strengthening for everyone. Thank you so much. Now, the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital has a strong focus on the family. In previous discussions, you've shared with us the importance of two generation interventions. Could you talk about how this influences both the research and clinical practice of the department? And I'd also ask you to talk about how this approach has shaped your engagement in our DC community through efforts like the Early Childhood Intervention Network and the Safe Babies, Safe Moms initiative. Yes, th thanks, thanks so much for those questions. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, Anyone who, who has ever been a child knows that kids don't grow up in a vacuum. Kids, kids grow up at the center of a complex social web um, that includes their siblings and their caregivers and parents and extended family, and uh, not to mention their teachers and coaches and, and community members. And yet, too often in healthcare, traditionally, I think, We've ad addressed things going on with the, in, with the child in terms of the child's emotions or behavior as though we could just address a child's sadness or anxiety or anger or learning difficulties or social challenges um, without trying to address the, the, the context as well. And so I, I think there's, in general, uh, a real trend, and I, I would even say a movement within child mental health care. Um, and it's certainly the, the great focus of our work at Georgetown is to make sure that we're not child psychiatrists or child psychologists or child social workers. We're family psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, therapists, because we have to take into account what are the stresses that are going on in a given family? What is the strengths in a family, the assets that a family has that it can draw on? Um, what are the values in a family that are important in sort of thinking about how to help the child? What are the ways in which unaddressed issues in parents. We talked about stigma before. Stigma is not just about challenges in our kids, it's about challenges in ourselves. And so often families will come to our clinic concerned, meaningfully concerned about their child's depression or anxiety or, or social difficulties, and yet not having yet been willing to address the fact that they may have themselves been living with depression for years. Um, they may themselves struggle with sleep or addiction and yet haven't had either the willingness or maybe even the time and the space to get themselves help. And we know that one of the biggest predictors of, of a healthy developing child is having healthy, developing, thriving, flourishing parents. And so we really try to bring that to the surface in our programs and say, if you, you know, we, we really want to be helpful for your nine year old. And while we're doing that, we're going to really try to understand how are you doing and how's your spouse doing and what's going on in your greater family. I um, mean, are the things that we can be doing to support your family unit, because that's going to help your child. And we really like to do that first before we direct any treatment uh, towards the child. So that's a big focus of our clinical work. And then from a research standpoint, we're looking at how do those approaches change outcomes for kids, accelerate healing, accelerate improvement, improve long-term mental health and thriving. We've tried to bring that approach to our work in DC as well. So we, we're, we're fortunate enough to have some really powerful, long-standing now multi-year 
collaborations with a number of community-based organizations in DC focusing on family well-being. So we do we collaborate with preschools and Head Start centers, with community-run organizations, parent-run organizations, to think about what what do families need in DC to flourish. Um, what does it mean to have a, a really mentally healthy, thriving family? And what are interventions that can be developed to really sort of accelerate families achieving their goals? And sometimes that means addressing longstanding mental health issues in a family that haven't been addressed. Sometimes it means getting connected with the right doctor or therapist. Sometimes it might mean getting into the right school. I think that there are in DC, in, in working with communities and families in DC, who have experienced not just decades, but generations of structural factors that have limited their family's abilities to thrive. Um, structural factors related to race and income uh, that are a big part of our city's history and a big part of our city's present. Um, and I think that that families and communities are understandably sometimes reluctant or skeptical of, of efforts around intervention that focus on mental health because um, Th these families have very good reasons in many cases to um, be struggling from a mental health standpoint and be struggling to thrive and flourish when they don't have access to economic opportunity, when they're not having good experiences at school, when their communities don't feel safe, and when their experiences with the healthcare system sometimes are really, really not very positive. And so I think from a, from in, in talking about mental health with our community partners and really to think about how do we get it come to this from a different angle, taking a family focus. Um, is a very, very powerful route in. Um, I think it's very, for, 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 for a number of communities and cultural groups, being focused on what will help your family thrive is a very different question than what kind of treatment does your child need. Um, it's much less stigmatizing. It's much less pathologizing. Um, it's much more focused on strength and assets that are intrinsic to our communities. And taking that approach, I think, has been a, a big part of the, the gains we've been able to make in terms of de developing not for communities, but with communities from a mindset of service, um, what it is that families are asking, actually asking for in order to feel like this is how we are going to feel healthy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take this just a little bit deeper. Uh, the pandemic has impacted all of us differently. Any of us can suffer from a mental health illness. We also know that mental health can be influenced by some of the external factors that you just mentioned, economic instability, food insecurity. When we think about children in our most vulnerable communities, which have been impacted that much more by the pandemic, what can we do to support our children now and in, and in the long term? How can we think holistically about mental health in our communities? It's a it's a terrific question. We're we're, um, we're we're working with the National Academy of of Child Psychiatry, the, it's called the American Association of uh, of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the American Academy of Pediatrics to talk about this this national emergency that we're really facing around kids' mental health. And and what your question reminded me of is a statistic that I read this morning, which is that 160,000 children have lost a primary caregiver to COVID in in the country. Um, so when we think about se over 700,000 deaths to COVID, that includes a lot of parents. So a lot of kids are now growing up from uh, uh, an experience of loss. So that's very true here in DC as well. COVID has disproportionately affected black and brown communities in DC and has disproportionately affected people who are involved in raising kids. Um, so I think we need to be very sensitive and tuned to the fact that kids experience of COVID are influenced by loss um, and that Kids are growing up having been deprived of key developmental supports, the opportunity to be at school every day, and the opportunity to have healthy and thriving adults around them. So that, that's our backdrop, that's our context. Moving forward, I think that we can be helpful to children by making sure that everywhere kids live and learn and play, that we have access to expertise around child development and around the impact of trauma and loss on kids and around thinking about how kids assets strengths and special abilities can be accentuated even in the context of loss and grief. Um, and so I, I, I want to see a day. Jack, where every kid walking into school in public school in DC from from early pre K from walking to school at three years old, all the way through high school 
that someone in that in their building, someone on campus, is someone that they know that they can talk to about difficulties that they're having, that there are mental health experts in the building every day who are able to help teachers and other staff understand this is what it looks like when kids are struggling. We're not going to stigmatize that behavior as bad behavior or a kid acting up or a kid trying to, to draw negative attention. This is a sign that a kid is struggling and we need to respond quickly, sensitively, and expertly in getting them access to services. They might need to see a therapist. Their parents might need help to make sure they're getting adequate economic means to put food on the table. They might need more secure housing. They might need uh, attention to a learning issue that they're having. But we need to see kids who are struggling as just that, as struggling, not as a, a, a target for, for punishment, but as a target for support and love. Well, Matt, I can't thank you enough for taking this time to share your reflections with us. As, as we bring this conversation to a close, is there one message that you'd like to share with our university community? I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of this community. And I think there, there, there's such good momentum and energy on campus here at Georgetown to, to be holistic, um, to be comprehensive in our thinking about flourishing, as you said, to, to really live and breathe Cura Personalis as an, as an organization. So that makes me very proud. Um, and and I, I hope to just communicate a, a, a message of optimism to folks on campus that that what allows us to flourish during adversity is community. Um, and this this is this is the right community for that. And so I think really encouraging people to lean on one another, um, to be open with one another, and to know that every conversation that you're having with a with a peer with a colleague, with a student about how are you really doing? And how's this going? And what help do you need? that helps that person have that same conversation with the next person. And we can really create a virtuous cycle there. Thank you, Matt, for all you do on behalf of our children and families. We are so deeply grateful to you. And thank you all again for joining us. I look forward to being with you again next week. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you. For every Hoya, everywhere. <laughs>